Hi, today's lecture is going to go with chapter two, uh, biological beginnings. Um, in this chapter, we have essentially four topics that I'm going to cover. Genetics, nature and nurture, that interaction, prenatal development, and birth. These are huge topics, <laughs> but in this class, and for this lecture, I'm just going to be going over the basics. That's all you're really required to know. Um, I'm assuming since nearly all of you are going into healthcare or the medical field that you either already know this information or you're going to be getting many other classes on it. So this is certainly not going to be the only source of your information. Okay, so let's start with genetics. Genetics is the study of genes, and in this case, of course, we're interested in human genes. Um, what are genes, right? They are basically groupings of DNA on a chromosome. They are considered the basic units of hereditary information, meaning the biological information you're getting from your biological father and biological mother, right? Um, you, we have identified, well, not me, but scientists have identified about 25,000 genes in humans. So each gene is uh, located on a specific chromosome, right? So um, you have from the smallest unit, the DNA, groupings of DNA are identified as a gene, and then those genes are located in different places on specific chromosomes you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. You get one half of each pair from your mother, the other half from your father. Every cell in your body contains these same 46 chromosomes, the 23 pairs. And you may be familiar with the fact that your 23rd chromosome is called your sex chromosome uh, because you get an X from mom and then you get an X or a Y from dad, and that determines your biological sex, male or female, right? Two X's is female, an X and a Y is male. So visuals are always helpful with this, right? Here you've got uh, an image drawing of a chromosome. These bands are supposed to signify locations of genes, where if you look closely, you'll see DNA structures and genes that have been identified. Here is um, the chart, the standard chart of what our 23 chromosome pairs look like with our last one here, the sex chromosome, right? Where you get this X from mom, from the egg, and an X or a Y from dad in the sperm. So um, our reproductive cells, meaning eggs or sperm actually only have 23 chromosomes, right? Because they're going to meet and fuse to become a zygote where they combine to get those 23 pairs. That's what your zygote is, what a zygote is. <laughs> um, if we look at twins, right? Identical twins, fraternal twins, right? There is um, less than 3% of pregnancies that are twins, monozygotic twins are identical twins. These are twins, two individuals that have the exact same genetics, right? They have, the, they're formed from the same zygote, copied itself. Dizygotic twins are what are called fraternal twins. This is when um, the woman releases two eggs and they both get fertilized. So it's like they're siblings, but they're being um, conceived at the same time, thus they're both in the same prenatal environment and are born at the same time. So monozygotic twins are identical, dizygotic twins are fraternal twins. Okay, when we look at genetic traits, um, we can talk about a whole bunch of different concepts. And again, I hope that this is review for you. Right, we have dominant traits and recessive traits, right? So let's look down here at this very simple two by two table, right? Where we've got um, father's genes and mother's genes. Let's imagine this is for eye color. This is an oversimplification by a long, a lot, right? But let's say a big B 
is for brown eyes and a little b is for blue eyes. Well, um, the big b brown eyes is a dominant trait, meaning that if you have a um, brown eye trait, either from mom or dad, you're gonna have brown eyes. Um, if you have a blue eye trait, the little b, you may or may not have blue eyes, right? Because if someone gives you that brown eye dominant gene, the brown eyes will take over. The only way to show that recessive trait is if your mom and your dad both give you the blue eyes. So that would be recessive. We also need to distinguish between genotype and phenotype. Now, genotype is your actual, the genes you have, um, the two chromosomes in that pair. But your phenotype is what you look like, what's actually expressed, right? So I may have brown eyes, which I do, but I'm not gonna know what my genotype is. Is it having two um, brown-eyed dominant genes or do I have a brown and a blue? I'm not sure what my genotype is. It's probably brown and blue because my dad has very blue eyes and my mom has very brown eyes. Um, so it's probably this one, the big B and the little B, but I don't know, right? But my actual genotype is what's in my genes. The phenotype is what you see. Now, if some you see someone with blue eyes in this example, then you can assume because it's recessive that you know their genotype also. If you have two of the same genes on that pair of chromosomes, that would be homozygous. So here are two brown-eyed genes or two blue-eyed genes. Those are a match, that's homozygous. If you have different ones, meaning a brown-eyed and a blue-eyed gene in that pair, that's heterozygous, so those look different. All three of these out of the four squares would be the same phenotype, but different genotypes, right? Okay, I'm oversimplified this with eye color and actually probably one of the only really simple examples of dominant and recessive traits with, its, with one gene is tongue rolling. I don't know if you've heard of this, right? If you can roll your tongue like this into like a tube, right? You've got the dominant gene. There are some people who cannot do that right, because they have the recessive genes. It's one single gene on your chromosomes. But most traits that we have don't involve one single gene. It's multiple genes across your entire set of DNA um, and all of your different chromosomes. So it might be a variety of locations on different chromosomes that all have to have a certain makeup to have that trait. And that's what's called polygenetic traits. So that's much more um, typical. And it's much more complicated to try to study and identify. If you hear about people saying, oh, I'm looking, for, a scientist is trying to identify a gene for a specific cancer, or for autism or something like that. Uh, it's not usually finding one specific location. It's a pattern across your entire genome. Okay, so very basic overview. Make sure you know these terms. Okay. You can, of course, have something go wrong. Now, don't be overwhelmed by this slide, right? I just wanted to throw it up here to give you an example. You can have um, problems, illnesses, and disorders that are related to um, genetic um, abnormalities or disorders. So some chromosomal abnormalities include this table on the left. Our most common one is Down syndrome, um, where you have three uh, 21st chromosomes instead of two, right? That creates the pattern of physical and cognitive issues that you see with a person who has Down syndrome. Um, so that would be a chromosome abnormality. There are a bunch of other ones listed. You do not need to, to memorize these or anything like that. I just wanted to give you some ideas. This is also in your book. There are also gene-linked disorders. So maybe it's a recessive trait, or something that's passed down through your family, like cystic fibrosis, diabetes, hemophilia, um, sickle cell disease. These are all um, things that are passed down um, through genes. And obviously they're problematic and cause illness, um, sometimes even death. So just to give you an idea that that's out there. 
So there is an area um, in the health sciences uh, called genetic counseling, which is pretty fascinating, right? Um, you can have an individual um, who wants to know what's their risk of passing on a genetic illness or disorder um, to their future children, right? Maybe you have um, something pretty significant in your family history and you go to a doctor to get genetic counseling to see what those risks are before you have children. You can also um, have genetic counseling while you are pregnant, right? You can have testing done, um, blood tests now, um, which are less invasive than um, amniocentesis, where they actually withdraw some fluid, right, from the uterus when you're pregnant, um, to analyze that, to tell you if your unborn child has any of these genetic, genetic problems. Um, it's interesting, right? Um, it just makes, you, makes me wanna um, have you think a little bit. Um, if you were um, considering having children, would you want to get genetic counseling? Would you want to know if there was a risk um, for you in your future or for your potential children to have a certain um, genetic disorder? Um, I will say when I was pregnant with my second child, I was over 35. Yes, I was 35. And so at that point, it kind of triggers a bunch of um, testing because you're considered old <laughs> to have children. And I, for myself, I chose not to have, get the testing done because um, I figured I'm going to have this baby no matter what. If it has, if he or she has Down syndrome or I'll just figure it out when I find out about it. Um, but I know many people who don't feel that way at all. They want to have as much information as possible before they have that baby. So it's just something to think about. Um, and it's an interesting area that you might not have really thought about for um, a health career. Okay, let's move to our second topic of nature and nurture. So I've um, talked about nature and nurture as being like nature versus nurture, but really they, they work together, right? Nature again is that DNA that you have and then nurtures the environment and everything that's influencing you. And this um, field of behavioral genetics is trying to look at how much do hereditary, heredity, sorry, DNA, and the environment influence specific traits. Uh, we can talk generally about a trait's reaction range. So that's how much variability can you have in that. Now, something like eye color, the reaction range is like almost nothing, right? What can you do to change someone's eye color? Nothing, right? Um, another physical characteristic, height. You might be able to predict someone's height based on um, your DNA, right? What you've gotten from your family. However, nutrition affects height too. So there is a little more wiggle room there. That reaction range is a little bit wider. And then when we look to things like personality, intelligence, our reaction range gets even bigger because there's so many environmental influences that can modify that. There's a really famous study called the Jim Twins. And I wanna show you a bit of this um, I will admit, pretty old, um, hello, okay, <laughs> old video. Let's pull this up here. But it's just fascinating. We're happy to accept the idea that physical characteristics like speed and endurance have a strong genetic component. Fast dogs are bred from parents who are fast. But when it comes to us, to our personality and the choices we make in life, we feel differently. The idea that we are all running around a track following some predetermined genetic script is repellent. But some twin stories really make you wonder. Now, although the story of Jenny and Margaret is pretty surprising, it's nothing compared with the astonishing story of the Jim twins. Meet Jim Lewis and Jim Springer. They have different surnames and they don't look much alike, but they are identical twins. The Jims were separated as babies and were reunited when they were 39 years old. 
It was a very good, warm feeling, you know? It's like uh, you have something a favorite of yours and you lost it and you have to have it, you know? And you finally find it and it's a good feeling to find, to find that thing. Well, that's where it was with Jim. Words came, really say. When the Jims met for the first time, they discovered that their lives were peppered with bizarre coincidences. My first wife's name was Linda. My first wife's name was Linda. I divorced Linda and married Betty. And then my second wife's name was Betty. And now I'm married to Sandy. Well, she's kind of leery that she hopes I don't ever come across her a Sandy. I got interested in the woodwork because uh, my father, he was always doing woodwork. Uh, I've been doing woodworking for quite a long time. My first son's name was James Allen. My first son was, was James Allen. My favorite beer was uh, Miller Lite, and I've always smoked Salem cigarettes. My favorite beer is, is Miller's Lite. And smoking, I, I smoke Camel Light, but then I smoke Salem Light, too. I, I switch back and forth. I was in the Sheriff's Department in Miami County as a deputy. I was a deputy sheriff for seven years. It's impossible to fathom the odds for some of the Jim's coincidences. The information is simply not available. But for some of the habits they shared, we can do the calculations. When the two Jims met in 1979, each was driving a Chevrolet, and it turns out, according to the experts, that the chances of any one man driving a Chevrolet then was seven to one. Now, both men driving a Chevrolet would therefore be 49 to 1. And they were also both heavy smokers and heavy drinkers. And the chances of any two men both being heavy drinkers would be about 35 to 1. And at that time, in 1979, the chance of any two men both being heavy smokers was about 300 to 1. All right, turn them on, Drew well, the chances of each one of these on its own isn't really that surprising. But if you put them all together, the overall coincidence is really rather amazing. To get the odds of all the similarities being down to pure coincidence, you have to multiply them together. In betting terms, it's called an accumulator. And these figures give you odds of half a million to one against two men sharing those habits by pure chance. Same sort of odds I might get here on any one dog winning every race till the end of the season. It would be impossible for me to win 50 races. And if you think it could win 50 races, I would offer you a half a million to one. Has that ever happened? It's never happened, no. And it never will happen. So you'd be safe as a book? It would be completely safe. If you take any two people and look hard enough, you'll always find some similarities. But the two gyms are so alike, despite being brought up by different parents in different homes, that it's hard to escape the thought that they've been shaped by forces deeper and ultimately more important than just their home environment. Psychologist Tom Bouchard has met more separated twins than anyone else in the world, but the gyms were his first. They kicked off a 20-year study that's changing the way we think about being human. First week we were there, we answered 10,000 questions, true or false, and multiple cases. We look at their hobbies, their uh, the jobs they've held, uh, their personality traits, their abilities. We took photos of her ears, of her eyes, and they took her fingerprints. Their height, their weight, their brain waves. The twins' IQ and personality profile were strikingly similar. It was as if they had tested the same person twice. The very first morning, we started to work with them. One of the twins put his hand on the, on the table, and I noticed that he bit his nails. I remember saying to myself, oh, isn't that interesting? Wouldn't it be interesting if his twin brother bit his nails? And as I was thinking that, his twin brother put his hand on the table, and sure enough, they were both nail biters. And I said, you know, that's not on any psychological test or any psychological characteristic. Okay. Pretty amazing. The gym twins. 
separated at birth, identical twins, and reunited in adulthood. The similarities are mind-boggling. This is getting at um, probably the best example possible of a twin study, right? Where you take identical twins that were reared in different environments. So they have the same nature, different nurture, and then you study them. This of course is unethical, but it has been done um, by tracing back um, adoptions where this happened. Uh, it's not very common, but you can um, do something a little more ethical, which is simply to study twins um, and to study um, fraternal twins and siblings, right? The differences between all of those as you have uh, increasing differences in nature, the DNA, right? but with similar home environments, nurture. Uh, adoption studies also are a way to kind of get at this behavioral genetics. If you've got the genetic information of what those parents, original biological parents were like, and then that child growing up in a different adoptive home with parents who have totally different DNA, right? So those adoption studies can also be used to try to tease apart nature and nurture. Based on research in behavioral genetics, we know that there are some traits that are highly genetic, especially physical traits, of course, right? Like height, weight, blood pressure, cholesterol levels, things like that. Um, your IQ can be best predicted by looking at the IQ of your biological parents. Um, not 100%, of course, but maybe like 50%, a better predictor. Um, your personality, right? You have a lot of similarities uh, in your personality to your biological parents. Um, although, you know, personal experience, I can say I'm a lot like my dad's personality, but not much like my mother's. Hmm? Um, and then there's a lot of disorders, illnesses that run in families. And for psychology, what's concerning to us, of course, is mental health issues. And we know that some disorders like schizophrenia, depression, alcoholism, autism, ADHD are highly genetic. So you are at risk, just like you would be for certain types of cancer or other illnesses if they're in your family tree, right? You are at risk for those, the same with your children. Okay, so now I really wanna tackle, um, there's a lot on this slide, right? I didn't wanna say that to begin with. Uh, we can talk about how someone's genes and the environment interact um, and affect people and those around them. So. These are four different descriptions of situations you might see in children as they're growing up. Okay, the first one, the passive genotype environment correlation, right? So correlation is meaning these things seem to be changing in the same way. This is when um, your genes and the family environment match up and encourage development of a certain trait. So like, let's say um, you have two parents that are musicians, very talented musicians. Um, their home is filled with music, musical instruments. They have a child and that child is genetically um, musically gifted and their home is filled with instruments and musical knowledge and that child succeeds, right, in music. That would be a passive genotype environment correlation. Our next one, the evocative genotype environment correlation, right? Where children's uh, ways of acting, their emotions, personality, and interests evoke responses from adults and the adults modify the environment. So let's say you have a child who is very extroverted naturally. They are very talkative and they are often um, smiling and engaging with the adults around them. This evokes responses from adults, right? That are also engaging, interacting, um, and that adult may seek to um, support that trait and give them lots of different opportunities to interact with the world around them. Um, like, let's say I have two children, right? My older one is very outgoing, very talkative, um, likes to meet new people, and I've gotten him lots of opportunities um, acting, singing, volunteering with other people, uh, and he's really in, even teaching at our church um, with the younger kids, right? And he's really enjoyed those experiences. My younger child is more shy, more introverted, and um, 
not interested in doing those things, but I have found activities that are more um, individual. Like he started doing Taekwondo, which is more of an individual sport, and he really enjoys that. Um, and other things that are more um, introvert activities that I've responded to because that's how he is. Okay, our third one, active genotype environment correlations. This is when the child really selects an activity that they are good at, and it may have maybe something that the parents have no experience or knowledge with, right? So um, both of my children, boys, like to do sports. My husband and I have no real experience with that. In fact, my younger son is going to do a golf tournament next week, no, next month, and I have no frame of reference for this situation. I'm signing him up and I, I'm baffled. I don't know how it all works, but I guess we're gonna show up. Um, yeah, he's pushed for this um, based on his own interests and what he sees in some of the neighborhood kids. Um, it is nothing I would have sought out at all. So that's him, active genotype environment correlation, or sometimes it's called niche picking. Like you're picking your thing, your niche. Okay, and lastly I wanna bring up is a non-shared environmental effect. This is fascinating to me. If you have siblings, then you've definitely experienced this. So a non-shared environmental effect is the um, fact that siblings who are growing up together generally have the same environment, but yet they still have very unique experiences on their own, individually with their parents and in their lives, right? So um, my sister and I were only a year and a half apart we grew up together, yet we have very different relationships with our parents. We have different memories of our certain experiences um, and different personalities, of course. So our similarities are shared, but then we also have all these non-shared environmental effects. Um, this can also be easily thought of um, with what's usually called the birth order effect. There's mixed scientific support for this, but it's the idea that um, firstborn children get treated differently than the youngest in the family, or an only child, or a middle child, right? So maybe you can relate to that. I'm the firstborn, I never enjoyed being told I had to watch my sister, or that I was older, I should know better when I'm only a year and a half older than her. Didn't make sense to me. <laughs> anyway, um, that would be our non-shared environmental effects. Okay, our third topic, prenatal development. Um, before we even get into it, I just thought this was kind of fun to, to think about. Um, women, females, were born with 400,000 eggs. It's quite a lot, right? They mature during puberty, right? When you start your period. Um, ovulation is every 28 days. Uh, for pregnancy, right, a sperm is going to meet the egg in the fallopian tube, right? As it's traveling down, um, this is not a sex ed class, but... You should know most of this stuff. I just thought the numbers were interesting. Um, males produce hundreds of millions of sperm every day. That's a lot. <laughs> and 300 million are ejaculated during sexual intercourse. Only one sperm is needed to fertilize that egg. 300 million are sent. That's um, amazing numbers to me. <laughs> okay, so let's say... This does happen. Sperm meets the egg, that is fertilization, and a zygote is created. You've got 13 chromosomes in the egg, 13 in the sperm. They come together, form the zygote, starts to divide and reproduce. That's a blastocyst. And this travels down the fallopian tube and implants in the uterine wall. Um, this is where the placenta and umb umbilical cord are going to be produced. Right? This is called the germinal stage. It is from fertilization to two weeks. Our second stage is the embryonic stage, weeks two to eight. Right, That cell is rapidly dividing, reproducing, um, and three layers are being created in this embryo. Right? Um, you don't need to memorize all this. I just think it's very interesting. Right, The ectoderm is the, um, going to consist of cells that will end up being the hair, skin, teeth, sensory organs. This is the outer layer of the embryo. The middle layer, the mesoderm, is going to be cells that will become muscles, bone, 
blood, the circulatory system, and the endoderm, the inner layer of the embryo, are cells that will become your digestive system, liver, pancreas, your lungs, right? So if you hear about someone who has um, what a syndrome where they have a variety of issues, um, for instance, in my speech and hearing class, we talk about a syndrome where someone has um, hearing loss um, and a often a tumor on their spinal cord. That's because something went wrong in prenatal development in the ectoderm, because our sensory organs and the spinal cord are created in that layer. Um, so when sometimes it seems like a syndrome has an odd collection of problem areas, it's actually related back to this embryonic stage. Now, the majority of prenatal development is in the fetal stage, from eight weeks all the way up to 40 weeks. <laughs> so this is the fetus. Um, those cells are differentiating, they're becoming different organs, um, different parts of the body. Um, between 8 and 24 weeks, typically uh, hormones are released that are going to start to differentiate the sex organs. And at 4 months, which is kind of fun, mother can typically start to feel the baby moving inside. Here's a, a visual of what this looks like. We've got our blastocyst here. Um, in the germinal stage, we've got um, the organs being developed and then this lovely looking fetus. <laughs> okay. Of course, um, there are problems during pregnancy often. Um, sometimes people just can't get pregnant, right? Infertility is um, often um, described as trouble conceiving, getting pregnant after a year to a year and a half of trying. Now, this um, length of time may be shortened based on, on increasing age. Um, there are different strategies to try to overcome infertility. I'm sure you've heard of these, like artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, having a surrogate. Um, these are all um, expensive options, um, but possible. And um, just important to know, about 15 to 20% of all pregnancies end in miscarriage. And I feel like this is something that is not talked about very much, right? Um, I have personally been pregnant four times and I have two children, right? So I, my first pregnancy was a miscarriage and it was pretty horrific actually. Um, and I really didn't know that this was so common. Um, but now that I, you know, once that happened to me, I started to learn about so many other women my age who had also experienced miscarriage. So it's very common. Okay. Um, now, Good prenatal care is extremely important because there are things that can damage or harm the development of that unborn baby. Um, anything that's an environmental agent that makes it produces a birth defect is called a teratogen. I've heard some people say teratogen. I don't know. I've never said it that way. Teratogen. Um, so the most common preventable cause of um, birth defects is alcohol right? Alcohol use by pregnant women. And this can result in a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So each individual is going to be different. Some may have very um, severe um, mental um, problems and physical deformities. Some might not. Um, some might just have more mild um, effects from alcohol ingestion during pregnancy. There's no safe amount of alcohol. So you should avoid it at all costs. There are other common teratogens and hazards like poor nutrition due to poverty, um, illness, um, like if the mother contracts German measles or uh, syphilis or something like that. Those things can harm the baby. Um, using drugs, prescription or um, recreational drugs can be harmful. It depends on which one. Um, you really need good prenatal care to make sure even using Tylenol or ibuprofen. These are things you need to talk about with your doctor. Of course, it's not just mom. Um, if the father is a heavy alcohol or drug user, there's, his sperm could be damaged and create genetic abnormalities. And uh, about four to eight percent of women who are pregnant are physically abused by their partner. So that can be a risk factor also. Okay, our last topic. Um, 
we are not going to watch a birth video or anything like that. Um, some of you are really interested in this and I know you will take classes on it. So just very generally, right? When you finally go into labor, you're th between 38 and 40, 42 weeks of pregnancy. Um, the, in you have three stages, the initial, initial stage, right? When you're you know you're due, you are having all the signs that you're going to start labor, and then you're actively in labor where you're having contractions, your cervix is expanding. Um, stage two is the actual birth of the child, and then stage, stage three is getting um, the placenta out, right? So that's the, our last part of the birth process. Um, it's a very... Um, uh, well, it's called labor for a reason, right? Um, once that baby is born, uh, that baby will be assessed along the APGAR scoring system. So make sure you understand this. You are responsible for knowing this. Um, APGAR is an acronym. So A is activity, then P is pulse, G, grimace, A, appearance, and R, respiration. For each one of these five um, you're going to give that newborn a score of zero, one, or two. The higher, the better, right? Um, so the highest um, score would be a 10. Um, if you have a seven to 10, that's good. Your baby seems to be in good shape. Um, four to six, moderately depressed. Maybe some inter medical interventions are needed here. And certainly if you're down zero to three, this is an emergency, right? You need immediate life-saving um, interventions. So here's some pictures of some newborns. Um, the one on the left uh, is just stolen off of Google. <laughs> so this baby, they don't come out beautiful looking, right? They're covered typically in what's called vernix, which is this waxy covering, which really is um, to protect their skin um, while they're in that water-filled uh, uterus. And um, often once they're cleaned off, you see that they have also what's called lanugo. Lanugo is kind of like a uh, hair. Well, it is. It's like a little furry, hairiness. Um, I can say my first baby, I saw he had like fuzzy shoulders. I was like, what is this? Right? The hair is also about um, trying to keep that baby's temperature regulated. And the hair just disappears after a while. Um, this was my baby after he was cleaned up, my firstborn. Uh, 10 pound baby. He's a huge little boy. Okay, so there are complications we got to talk about. Um, this is the, the last slide for this lecture. Uh, you want that baby to be born ideally between 38 and 42 weeks. Um, if that baby's born before 38 weeks, they're considered a preterm baby. Uh, which puts them at risk, right, for having complications. Um, but the bigger issue really is their weight. Um, my second child was born at 37 weeks, but he was seven pounds. No, eight pounds. So he was done. He was ready to come out. If you're below 5.5 pounds, right, that is a low birth weight. And that might mean that you have some of your um, development has not completed and you were born too early. You may need some assistance. Um, you can be born at, a, at 38 weeks or so, but you might be too small for the date. And if you have um, a weight of two and a quarter pounds, right, or you're born below before 30 weeks, that is considered a very low birth weight. You're going to be in the intensive care unit. Right now, um, medically, the um, age of viability, I mean the earliest that a child can be born and survive is 22 weeks. That's amazing. Um, since 40 is how long a typical pregnancy lasts. Um, a child born at 22 weeks has about a 50% chance of surviving and may have a, a lot of uh, physical and cognitive complications. On the other end of the spectrum, you want that baby born before 42 weeks because at some point your body is not going to be able to support that child anymore. So babies that are post mature need to be born and may, you may need intervention to start labor. If there is a problem during delivery, um, then your doctor and you may decide you need to have cesarean delivery, which is surgical removal, make, make an incision on your abdomen and remove the baby. Um, both of my children were born by cesarean section. Um, it wasn't anything I had considered before it was done. 
Um, some people are very traumatized by this. I personally was not. I was fine. The doctor said what had to be done and that's what we did. Um, and then of course, there, the, the worst situation is that your baby actually dies during labor or birth um, and that would be a stillbirth. Uh, once that baby is born, um, often, um, uh, you know, it's a huge adjustment. Lots of sleep deprivation, <laughs> a, a massive change to your lifestyle and everyday functioning. About 10% of women develop postpartum depression, uh, which is very serious and um, needs to be addressed so that that mother and baby are being cared for. Um, and a higher percentage of women develop what's called the baby blues, which is just a general uh, mild depression and often associated with sleep deprivation um, and exhaustion. Um, having to wake up every two hours to feed your baby is not a good recipe for positive mood. Um, but anyway, something to look out for. Certainly if the mother has experienced depression in her life before being pregnant, it's something to really look out for um, during pregnancy. Okay, so this is kind of our whirlwind through chapter two, uh, but these are the basics um, and hopefully this has been very helpful for your study of this chapter.